In this episode, we look at the struggles of moderate Republican and retired sports reporter Michelle Tafoya as she tries to stop the world from making her babies feel bad in our post-racial era. And Tucker Carlson celebrates her American ideal. Then we look at how the Ohio GOP is trying to run out the clock to maintain their supermajority in the legislature. They are on the finish line and want to change the rules. I'm Doug Berger, and this is Secular Left. One of the arguments right-wingers make about race is they claim that all lives matter and we should only judge people based on their character and not skin color. Uh, we saw that when they brought, trotted out the uh, Martin Luther King uh, speech about that, about the I, I have a dream. That's the only thing they focused on. They make the further claim that people who point out systemic racism or the need to fix such racism are the actual racists who think skin color is more important than character and make white children feel bad. Of course, that is a crock of shit, and they know it. They frame the argument that way to shut down any debate by claiming a moral high ground like white people saying they don't see color, when their actions say otherwise. They're all about maintaining the status quo. We hear similar distractions after a mass shooting when the right says, now is not the time to talk about gun control. People need to grieve. And then they, we never do talk about it. Or if we try to talk about it, they change the subject. They claim they care about sh the shooting while not caring about solving them so they don't happen again. Recently retired NBC sports reporter Michelle Tafoya joined the conservative gravy train when she started complaining about her kids having to have school picnics for families of color. She, of course, she got a primetime slot on white supremacist supporter Tucker Carlson's Fox News show. Let's take a look at a clip from that show, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Uh, it's been on my mind for quite a while, Tucker. Thank you for having me. And no, NBC did not encourage this. They did not force this. This has been on my mind. I've been waking up every day with a palpable pull at my gut that uh, my side, my view, my, my middle ground kind of moderate viewpoint is not being represented yeah. to the rest of the world, I didn't feel. And, um, and so rather than, you know, just banging it out on Twitter or Instagram every day, I thought, I've got to do something. I have benefited greatly from the American dream, and I feel like, for the sake of my kids, and because I so love this country, I've got to start giving back. Boy, that is the best possible reason. So, people who watch sports, of course, know you and have for many years. You went on The View recently, which is a slightly different venue for you. We have just a short clip, and I want to ask if this had some role in your decision. Here it is. <laughs> my kids in school, there is a big, big focus on the color of your skin. How and old my are children, your children? My children are now uh, 16 and 13. Okay, in what it's, way? It's been going on since they were in lower school, mm -hmm. all right? And it is that there are affinity groups on campus for... Mm -hmm. my, my, my son's first best friend was a little African-American boy. They were in separable. Mm -hmm. Get to a certain age, they start having what's called an affinity group, which means you go for lunch and pizza with people who look like you. Suddenly, my son wasn't hanging out with him anymore. Why are we even teaching that the color of the skin matters? Because to me, what matters is your character and your values. Yes, but you know, you live in the United States. You know that color of skin has been mattering to people. Can't for, we for change years. it that it well, doesn't? Well, we, we need white people to step up and do that. But I think that we, they've been doing that since the Civil War. And no, I'm not saying no, it's No, 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 they, they haven't. Their... Wow, that was such a... A, such a moderate thing to say, such a sensible thing to say, um, and yet it seemed like such a controversial thing. I thought that was really brave that you said that. What did you think of the reaction? I'm just astonished that we're, we're so looking in the rearview mirror and not absorbing the progress yes. that we've made in this country and building on it and recognizing it. Um, I, you know, uh, 
I don't think a person like Whoopi Goldberg would have had that role 50 years ago. She right. has that now. I mean, that, I, I, we, you and I know, Tucker, we could come up with a million examples. And it breaks my heart that my kids are being taught that skin color matters. And to me, if you want white people to step up, I was stepping up when I addressed the school and said, exactly. why are we having these picnics for families of color? Why are we separating our kids? It, the world is integrated. Let's continue that and, and, and have everyone find out what we all have in common, not just what we have in common with people who look like us. Man, uh, you know, I, I would I bet you 20 bucks that 95 percent of Americans agree with what you just said. And I, but to say that when you work at NBC Sports or any big media company really takes I mean, you must have known that you would be attacked for defending the American ideal as you did. Why did you do that? Because I don't care if I'm attacked. Um, I really am not afraid of that. And I guess I feel like so many people now are afraid. Yeah. And I'm not. Um, listen, I know there are repercussions for whatever I choose to say. Uh, I, and I've talked to my kids' school about it. You know, please don't hold this against my kids. I'm speaking for me. I'm speaking for my family. But please don't hold this against my kids. But this is what I really believe. I think I speak for a lot of people, like you said, Tucker, and a lot of these people, my friends, are afraid to repost things that I've posted or, you know, get into political conversations. They are, and they've said it, I'm afraid. I don't want to get in these arguments with my friends, with my boss, with my colleagues. This is the most terrifying thing in the world to me right now, that people are afraid to talk. These are words coming out of our mouths. Yeah, yes. we could probably hurt people with our words. I acknowledge that. But I get to choose my reaction to everybody's words. And everybody else gets to choose their reaction to my words. So they can choose to react to what I say. I'm going to choose to, to say what I believe and what I feel very strongly about. And, and um, I'm going to continue this. And, and this, is, this is the direction I'm headed. I just love it so much. So I hope you found some pretty interesting things. Uh, it starts out with Tafoya claiming that she has moderate views. Of course, many people like Michelle who are wealthy and live in a white area of the country never claim to be racist. And they claim that any talk about complaining about racism is wrong. You know, we, we can't be divided. We have to be together. Why can't we be together? Um, and so that was the first thing that caught my eye when I heard this, this uh, interview was that she claimed to be a, a moderate. Uh, the other thing too, notice on the cryon, the little words at the below the screen, uh, when you watch the video, and I have a link in the show notes, um, Tucker Carlson's show people put down that she was upset about anti-white teaching. You know, that's white supremacists uh, talk about that. But, uh, and, and also I want to point out too, that Michelle Tafoya grew up in Manhattan Beach, California. Now Manhattan Beach is 85 to 90% white. They have less than 1% uh, people of color, less than 1% Hispanic, less than 1% Asian. So it's probably 98 to 99% white, or at least it used to be, uh, especially when she was growing up there. Manhattan Beach is also well known for another beach. It's called Bruce's Beach in the center of Manhattan Beach near the, near the ocean. And for a long time, it was a city park. And what a lot of people don't realize or didn't realize till recently was that the land that that city park was built on belonged to an African-American family, the Bruce's, hence the name Bruce's Beach. And they had, for a long time in the early 20th century, a, uh, a resort that catered to African Americans. Because back in that time, in Jim Crow times, uh, blacks and whites were not allowed to mix when they were having fun. So you had resorts that, that excluded blacks. So they built their own. And one of them was Bruce's Beach. And it was well known, very popular. And then the city took it. 
with little to no compensation because they wanted to build a city park. It was prime real estate. And for years, for decades, they didn't build a park until finally somebody pointed out, hey, you were supposed to build a park, so they did. And then in 2020, finally, uh, the city and the state, um, well, the state passed a law that returned that property back to the Bruce family. So that's Manhattan Beach. That's where Michelle Tafoya grew up. Uh, her and her family now, her husband and kids, grow, uh, live in Adena, Minnesota, which is outside Minneapolis. And it, too, is a, not as much. It, it was a majority white neighborhood. And they had sundown laws and deed restrictions, just like Manhattan Beach did, to keep black people out. So, you know, when Michelle Tafoya talks about being together and not being divisive about race, she does not have much room to talk. She, she personally probably is not a racist, but she does not know what racism is or doesn't uh, understand it. Um, in that uh, Tucker Carlson clip, they had a clip of her on The View, and that's probably what got her the shot on Tucker Carlson, was that she had an argument with Whoopi Goldberg and saying, you know, why can't we just be together? And, and Whoopi says, well, you do know you need, live in the United States. You know, skin does matter, and it still does. And so Michelle said, well, it hasn't mattered, you know, since the Civil War, which is totally bogus. It, <laughs> you know, it, it, and that's what you get from these right wingers is they talk about, you know, our post-racial world and there's no more racism because this black person stars on a TV show. Well, Back in the 50s, when the Jim Crow laws were really strong, even in, even in the North, even in what now is California and New York, uh, Nat King Cole had a show. He was a star of a show as well. And there was still racism. So just because one black person is successful and is a star of a show doesn't mean that racism doesn't exist or that systemic racism doesn't exist. Now, I don't know about her story about the school lunches because I really haven't gotten into checking on those claims. But what I get from her was that her son was friends with this African-American boy and they had these affinity picnics at school and now they're not friends. Um, I don't know what, what's up with that. Uh, it would really help if we knew if these picnics were required to be attended if they were voluntary, and also, would they exclude people who were not of that affinity? Um, I don't believe most schools that would have something like that would do that. Um, but anyway, so Michelle is going to get involved with some Republican campaign work. I think she's working for a gubernatorial candidate somewhere in the United States. I'm not sure well where because I really don't follow it that much. But I just wanted to highlight what she was talking about and how conservatives do this as they, they turn it around. They, they always say that if you call out racism or try to fix racism, that you make my kids feel bad and that you're being a racist. And that's not the case at all. Uh, Greg Sargent had a um, uh, op-ed piece in the Washington Post about Tafoya's appearance on uh, Carlson's show. And I kind of wanted to read what he said because I think, I think it's very important. Um, he taught, he mentions after, after talking about the clip, the clip that was shown with, uh, Whoopi Goldberg. Um, he said, uh, putting, put aside for now the erasure of post civil war, white terrorism, Jim Crow, and the fact that it took until the mid 1960s to achieve multiracial democracy after decades of violent struggle. What's being obscured here is the true nature of the disagreement. Goldberg and many others disagree with Tafoya and Carlson about the amount of racial progress we've made, the cause and true nature of lingering disparities, and how much work remains and how to do that work. Tafoya gestured at this, telling Carlson that we should appreciate the progress we've made in this country rather than looking in the rearview mirror. 
Tafoya and Carlson are, of course, entitled to their opinion, even if it rests on a sanitized version of our vision of our past. Where they stray into sleazy, bad faith rhetorical hustling is by insisting those who disagree with them are the ones who insist skin color should matter, that Tafoya and Carlson represent the only true race neutral position. In their framing, offering a more pessimistic and less celebratory view of how much racial progress we've made and what remains to be done amounts to telling children they are inherently de debilitated or tainted. This cynical scam uses children as rhetorical shields to shut down debate. The real aim is to take that less celebratory view of racial progress off the agenda entirely. If you raise this pessimistic view, you're telling children their skin color matters. And the other way that we, we see that type of framing that uh, Sargent points out is when we talk about affirmative action, correcting the mistakes of the past through affirmative action, you know, and white people claim that that's reversed racism. And I keep having to tell people that white people, you, you can't be racist to white people. You can be prejudiced to white people. You can dislike white people, but racism denotes power, uh, denotes control of, of the power and, uh, people of color and Hispanics and women, they do not have hold of that power that belongs to white people so far. Um, you know, the demographics are not in white people's favor as we move through history. So we move through time. Um, they will be get less and less. Uh, but right now in today in 2022, white people hold the power and because they hold the power, black people can't be racist to them. The system can't be racist. Affirmative action is not racist to white people. And that's what, that's what many of these white uh, right wingers don't understand. They understand the concept of racism and how it's bad, but they think it's an equal thing that, that, uh, keeping somebody, uh, out of a job because they're white in order to give it to a marginally, uh, a marginal group, such as a woman or a person of color is somehow equal to that woman or black person not getting the job because they weren't white. They think that that's equal. And the way I look at it is white people are, uh, some white people are upset about correcting racism. Uh, and they think, you know, I'm colorblind and skin shouldn't matter. And they say that because they're already at the finish line. You know, it's like a track meet, you know, they're already at the finish line and they want to change the rules. That's how, that's what, how a good number of these white people work, you know, is they want to change the rules once they're at the finish line, right? So if you change the rules to, to better allow marginal groups to get to the finish line, then that's racism. And that's not good. We shouldn't do that. Race, all lives matter. You know, you've heard all of it. You've heard all of those types, those types of uh, sayings. Uh, in the last couple of years, and it's ridiculous. It's uh, it's a it's a load of crap. Um, again, <laughs> you cannot be racist to white people. You know they hold all the cards. We all hold all the cards. You know I'm a cisgendered white male. I'm at the top of the power paradigm, and I'm telling you the game is rigged against people who are not a white cisgendered male. And that's got to change. And we've got to change the rules. And so, Michelle Tafoya, you are not a moderate. You do not have a moderate view. And you may not be racist yourself, but as, as the meme said, it's not a deal breaker for you. And I really think you need to get educated and learn you know, which is surprising because you reported on the NFL for 30 years and you've, you've interviewed hundreds, if not, you know, at least a few hundred black 
football players. You've been exposed to the locker rooms of all these NFL teams. And you have such a skewed view of racism. It's ridiculous. It's like would you have like a bubble suit on and with blinders and it's like football, 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 and nothing else. You know, a lot of these football players, Kaepernick, you know. Did you, I, I think you interviewed Cap, Colin Kaepernick, maybe? I'll have to go back and check. But anyway, so that's Michelle Tafoya, you know, so don't feel bad for her kids. Uh, her kids are learning that there is diversity in this country and, and, it, and it would behoove white people to learn it and, and acknowledge that you're already at the finish line and it's not going to take anything away from you to help other people get there and correct the wrongs of the past. Hello, this is Doug, host of Secular Left, reminding you that I like to be validated. If you like this podcast and want to thank me, feel free to buy me a coffee. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash secularleft and donate some cash to help make this a better show and validate me as a person. You'll feel better in the morning. The other story that I want to talk to you about today is similar to the Michelle Tafoya story that we just covered in that the framing is the same. Um, it's the conservative playbook. Uh, it's over gerrymandering here in Ohio. Um, it's time to, to redraw the maps. And luckily, I guess, luckily, some would say probably not lucky, but luckily in 2015 and 2018, they had ballot measures that changed the way that maps were drawn for legislative districts in Ohio, both state and federal. And it was given to a commission, a redistricting commission, uh, Ohio has a supermajority, Republican supermajority in the legislature. And so they have a, a majority on this commission. And so they're supposed to draw the maps. Um, it's been like pulling teeth. The, the Republicans have pulled out every political uh, shenanigans that they can in order to protect their supermajority in the legislature. Uh, the first thing that they did was they claimed that the census data was late and that they sued to get it released because they needed it. They said that was going to cause problems. Uh, the census, the 2020 census, was tainted by uh, the previous administration, Trump, because they tried to manipulate the data uh, to support white supremacy. And so it took a little bit more time once the administration changed in order for them to get the numbers. So they got the numbers, they created a map. Uh, the first map was the legislature, uh, the state legislative districts. They did not, the Republicans did not consult with the Democrats. They were supposed to have public hearings and people could comment. They had public hearings but they were usually at one or two o'clock in the afternoon when a lot of people can't show up. So they came up with this map and it was obvious that it was not going to be constitutional. And Governor DeWine even said he didn't think that the map was constitutional, but he voted for it anyway, because that's what Republicans do. Even though they talk a good game about being law and order and, and do, you know, getting that wall built and getting rid of immigrants. When it comes to the law applying to them, then they tend to look the other way. So we got an unconstitutional map. Uh, groups filed a lawsuit in, in the Ohio Supreme Court, and the Ohio Supreme Court agreed that the maps that the Republicans drew uh, were not constitutional, so they had to go back. So there wasn't any other commission meetings until the deadline came up and they met and passed another map that looked very similar to the previous one. 
Well, the the groups out for having a fair vote uh, sued again, and it went back to the, U the Ohio Supreme Court. And the Ohio Supreme Court again agreed that the map that was passed was not constitutional. And and so this is how this is how I guess I should back up just a little bit in the process. Um, most of the time you do a redistricting map, it's supposed to last 10 years until the next census. But when they changed the way that the legislative maps were drawn here in Ohio, they put in a loop, uh, I call it a loophole, that if they can't agree on a map, if the commission can't agree on a map, then the map that is adopted would only last for four years. And then they would have to do it again. They'd have to go back and draw it again. Well, when you're already in a supermajority, four years, you know, that's still maintaining your power. And then you just go back and do it again until, you know, you just run the clock out. So anyway, so they tried twice and the Supreme Court threw them out twice. So they were supposed to get back together again. Well, again, they didn't have any meetings until the deadline date. And they decided this time they weren't going to pass a map. Uh, the Democrats offered one up that they did, uh, and they drew it uh, based on the proportion. It's supposed to be proportional. In Ohio, it's, I think it's roughly 54% 54, 54 Republican, 48% Democrat. Uh, for congressional maps, what they were thinking is it would be 15 congressional people with the proportions it would be seven Republican, eight Republicans, seven Democrats. All right. Uh, similar with the state legislature, it would be uh, a majority Republican, but a, a good enough number of Democrats. Well, the the Republicans just threw up their hands and said, "We can't come up with a map," even though the Democrats had a map, and uh, other groups like the Fair Voting Group they came up with a map. And, and that met all the requirements in the Ohio Constitution. So they threw up their hands. They said, there, there's just no map. And the one that um, Al, uh, Representative Alan, Allison Russo, who's on the commission, brought up was uh, they basically bullied her about it. They claimed that it was racist. <laughs> you know, going back to the FOIA thing, the fact that some Republican legislators were going to possibly lose their job when they redrew the districts because it would be more, it would lean more Democrat. And it, they thought that that was unconstitutional and undemocratic. That's what they said. And they said it was racist because I guess some, some of the Republican legislators were, were white. I don't know, but that's what they make up. Okay. So they've been dragging their feet the whole time introducing these maps that they know are not constitutional. And they were hoping that because there was a Republican majority on the Ohio Supreme Court, that they would agree and they would get this map for four years and they could move on. Well, it hasn't worked out that way. The Ohio Supreme Court has actually done its job, uh, thanks to uh, Maureen O'Connor, who's the Chief Justice. She's the one that has voted with the Democrats on on the Supreme Court to throw out these maps. So at least there's one Republican that is hopeful that democracy works. All right. So what I want to do is, uh, it was covered by uh, 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 Spectrum News One out of Columbus, covers Ohio. They had some interviews with the players that be. Uh, you're going to see this in this clip. You're going to hear from uh, what the social media is calling mapless Matt Huffman, who's the the uh, the Senate president, Ohio Senate president from Lima, and they call him mapless Matt Huffman. Uh, he's also a doctor who doesn't know how medical science works, but that's another story. And then you also hear from uh, House Speaker uh, Bob Cup, also from the Lima area, and they're these two guys are making Northwest Ohio look terrible. I'm telling you. And then you also hear from Jen Miller. She's from the League of Women Voters. And then finally from Allison Russo, who's the um, ruling Democrat on, on the commission. She's the, 
the uh, Democratic uh, majority leader. Uh, also in the, you also hear from Vernon Sykes, who's also a Democrat. He chimes in uh, during when the reporters interviewing Bob Cup. You'll hear him because um, Bob Cup will claim that the that the Democrat map was unconstitutional, and Vernon Sykes will say, "Well, that's your opinion." <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, anyway, so let's listen to that clip. You criticized the Democrats' maps, but why didn't Republicans offer any maps if you had such a problem with them? Well, it was, I think it was pretty clear in the statement that I made and that others made that I don't think it's possible, as Governor DeWine said and others, to comply with all of the requirements in the, in the Constitution, the two Supreme Court decisions, federal law and federal constitutional law. I don't think it's possible to do that. But you didn't even want to try? We did try. That's what we've been doing for the last 10 days. But you didn't want to present it, I'm saying. Why didn't you even want to present it just to see what you Because think? it's not possible to do that. you have a question? Yeah, when did you come to the conclusion that it was impossible? In the last 24 to 48 hours. In question? Your, in your mind, what's the next step? What do we do? Because I don't know. Don't I don't know. I, I, I don't have a next step. Is there any so. legal counsel you refer to to say what, what happens now? No. Do you no, think that the no. Supreme Court may choose to just accept the Democrats' maps or other maps since you didn't vote? I have no idea. That Thank sets you, up everyone. the Supreme Court. Thank you. What happens now? Um, well, this is, um, as we've said a number of times, this is a new constitutional process. There is no precedent to follow. Um, he, we, we, um, there's no, at this point, it's obvious that there's uh, no consensus uh, for a majority on this commission for any particular map. There's not even a clear understanding of what the court is requiring us uh, to do. Uh, we will keep working uh, on it, um, but I would just have to say the way forward is not clear. So you will keep working on a legislative, I mean, what's that mean, a legislative map? Or what do you mean by we will keep working on trying to, uh, how to produce a map for the legislative districts, but, but the way forward is not clear. Between now and midnight you're going to work on that? So when are you going to work on it if the deadline is tonight? We'll be working on it. The fact that you're not meeting this deadline from the Ohio Supreme Court, are you afraid that they might just take the Dems maps or any other maps that were presented? I'm not going to speculate on what a court might do. So what was the status of the options you, you talked about, uh, you know, Blake and Ray working on? I mean, why didn't you guys have something presented here? I think it's pretty clear. We're not sure where the way, what the way forward is. We're not sure what we're required to produce. We're not sure what the court would accept. Uh, and so with all of those things, and quite frankly, uh, one of our map makers has been uh, rather ill for the last few days, so, or more in the last few days. So it's just, a, it's a, the court has asked us to do an impossibility under the circumstances. But how do you criticize one pair of maps without even offering up your own? We've offered up. We've offered but not up publicly. Three or four maps, I think. I mean, I mean, today you didn't offer anything. No. And nobody else has produced a constitutional map either. That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> it was sure. It sure became apparent that it has a lot of constitutional flaws. Indeed, the, the court has not ruled on it. But the, yeah, those are just accusations yeah. made by you. Your caucus does not support moving the primary, but you just heard Secretary LaRose out loud say that you're getting dangerously close to violating federal law. Does that change anything about your opinion, or you think it changes anything about your caucus's opinion to want to move the primary? I don't think in the House that there is a majority for moving the primary election at this time, uh, let alone the two-thirds it would require to have it go into effect right away. So you One think last be okay question. with breaking federal law? No, not in favor of breaking any law. Do you think this is Thank what you. the people who Thank passed you. those amendments a couple of years ago wanted? Thanks, everyone. So what do you guys do now? Do you file objections? What's your recourse? We're going to continue to advocate for change, uh, continue to uh, promote our maps, uh, and uh, we're waiting on, we'll have to wait, of course, on the court uh, to consider what has been or hasn't been done. And, and so we're waiting for direction from the court at this particular time. Do you think that the Supreme Court should take your maps? I think that the, the court, uh, according to the Constitution, uh, has to refer it back to uh, the commission. The court cannot uh, uh, adopt maps themselves. Uh, so and that's why we're at this point right now in impasse, because the commission doesn't have the will to actually 
comply with the court. But we've done this three times. So what makes you think a fourth time is going to change anything? I think the court may have some other options. Uh, in like a, I, I'm not sure. I'm not a member of the court. But uh, uh, I believe there are some other options, and we have to wait to find out what they will do. Are you concerned about any of the members of the commission being held in contempt of court for not following the court order? I believe that is a possibility, but uh, I'm not a lawyer, and, and that's not my realm of authority. you be okay with it? Authority. Uh, I am okay with moving us forward, what we, whatever can be done to help us move forward. Including contempt? Including whatever we can do. The court clearly needs to weigh in, um, but we w all I can tell you is what we're going to do. We will file objections in the court. We will explain all the ways that it's possible to uphold every aspect of the Ohio Constitution when creating state house and state senate maps. And uh, we will also explain why the legal interpretations that were presented in this hearing were inaccurate. Um, again, if we really wanted to grapple with the Ohio Constitution and we really wanted to make the maps that the Ohio voters deserve, then we would have started this process a lot earlier. We would have had lots of nonpartisan experts explaining things like proportionality and the Voting Rights Act. Instead, what we see, quite frankly, is some oversimplified understanding of the law that they are uh, using to make excuses. They disobeyed the court's order, and one possible outcome could be contempt of court. Is that something that you'll be pushing for? I can't speak to that. Do you think that they might be good for them? I don't know. I mean, I really can't speak. I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. I really don't know because at the end of the day, you know, we have an incredible team of lawyers and experts that will be deciding what our best path forward is. Our thing isn't about being mad at anyone. We're just trying to get maps that work for the people of Ohio. And so the way that we go forward now will be to try to maximize that. Um, this process has shown it doesn't work. So how, what do you think the Supreme Court should do when it comes to maps? Because we have a primary coming around May 3rd. So the bottom line, what I'll say is this. Um, the primary is, you know, we have been at the league and our partners have been talking about this timeline being problematic since January of 2021. So it's absolutely regrettable that we are stuck in this situation right now where everyone is going to have to react to change a primary. Boards of elections and voters deserve better than that. Um, does the process work or not? I mean, I guess it doesn't, but I would argue that they never really upheld the process and that they never really tried to uphold the process. Um, but we need to take it one step at a time. The next step is to file an objection with courts and then we'll see what they do and we will continue to move this forward. They didn't introduce a map, but they continuously question your map. How do you think all this is going right now and where do you think this is headed? Well, I think um, not a surprise that that was the strategy because they have no map. Um, and likely will not introduce a map, and so this is simply a distraction um, from the work that needed to be done at hand that they did not do. Um, but I think that what we showed uh, with our presentation and demonstrated through answers to their questions that our map is constitutional, it is possible to achieve what the court has put forward, and that is what we attempted to do, and um, they chose not to consider that. That defies what the voters of Ohio have asked overwhelmingly for this commission to do, what the courts have asked for this commission to do. And to me, it is a direct assault on our democracy and on Ohio voters. If that happens, would you ask the court to impose your map? Uh, if that happens, um, we likely will not, um, we'll see what the court decides to do with that. The court, um, again, you know, they have many different tools at their disposal um, to make sure that uh, I believe this commission complies um, with what they have asked us to do. When making that map, uh, Huffman accuses you of only forcing Republicans into uh, confrontational situations in districts. I mean, was it possible to do that to Democrats or, or not possible? Well, again, uh, Republicans hold super majorities in both the House and the Senate. So by virtue of uh, creating a constitutional map that is also proportional, there will be Republicans who lose seats. And um, you know, that, that is just a reality of drawing fair districts. You introduced these maps last week. What do you have to say about Republicans only giving you feedback today on the final day with hours before the scheduling? 
What I have to say is that it's not surprising, um, and we suspected all along that this would be the strategy that they would use. Um, again, they've shown time and time again that they have no interest in entering into this uh, as both uh, fair discussions or fair negotiations. Okay, so essentially what's happening is that the Republicans are running, out, trying to run out the clock. Um, the other thing that uh, is happening is Frank LaRose, who, who is the Secretary of State, is also on the commission. He is complaining that if we don't adopt MAP soon, then it's going to mess up the primary. There's a, a May primary. Um, the deadline to run in the May primary has already passed. They didn't change it. The Republicans don't want to change the primary date. And the reason why they don't want to change the primary date is because they want to force the courts to adopt their map. See, they're, it's all about getting this map passed because they want to use it for four years. And that's all they care about. They, they care about maintaining their supermajority, even though in the past 10 year thing that they've looked at for voting patterns, they should not have a supermajority. They, they think that they should have 60 or more uh, House seats, and they shouldn't have 60 or more House seats. They should have about 54 House seats to, um, to the Democrats' 48% of House seats. And so they're just trying to run out the clock. Uh, they had uh, the Ohio Right to Life group filed a lawsuit in federal court demanding that that the federal court institute the last Republican map, really? A right to life group? Um, no, I mean, that's bizarre. Uh, the Ohio Supreme Court was not amused that they could not come up with a, a map for the third time. And they have ordered the commission to appear before them on Wednesday, eight, uh, federal, February 23rd, uh, to show just cause why they should not be found in contempt of court. And of course, being found in contempt of court could be possible jail time. Um, it could also be that the Ohio Supreme Court will impose a map. And then that will probably go to court as well. But a lot of this stuff could have been fixed had one, Mike DeWine and the other uh, uh, Republican leadership actually got a backbone and rejected the maps to begin with and forced them to come up with a decent map that they could work with the Democrats so the Democrats could agree to it. You know, because like I said, the first set of maps, Mike DeWine was like, hey, these are unconstitutional, but let's pass them anyway. Uh, Frank LaRose could ask to have the primary moved. All it would take would be a vote in the legislature and then he could move it to June. But he doesn't want to do that. Because it's all about the power. It's all about the status quo. It's all about being at the finish line and changing the rules to make sure that you win. And, and it's just undemocratic. It just really is. It's not only undemocratic, but also the, the way that they want to crack and pack some of these districts and break up uh, some of the large urban areas into multiple districts to dilute uh, the voting power for the people of color. And so things like this, this is particularly the reason why we need to have federalized elections for exactly these reasons. And Ohio is not the only state that's having issues with redistricting. There's uh, at least two or three other Republican states that are trying to rig it so that they're in power for decades to come. And that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be allowed. It shouldn't be the case. So I think that's why we need to federalize elections. And so that's what I recommend is you go talk to your legislator and, and have them uh, get them to get people to move. And here in Ohio, people need to just get rid of Mapless, Matt Huffman, and Speaker Cup because those two just do not know how to govern at all. I mean, that's why you get... Uh, you get gerrymandering causes these extreme laws... Like, there's a law that just been introduced that would penalize teachers, that would force them to lose their license if they teach about racism in schools. You know, and then you get the ridiculous law that just was introduced that would uh, 
forced doctors to tell women that they could undo chemical abortions by taking another pill, which is not the case, you know. And then, and then you had the other, the other bill that forced women who have lost their children because they were either uh, uh, stillborn or uh, miscarriage to force them to fill out a death certificate and bury the fetus. All because they wanted to get back at, at women that get abortions. That's what happens when you have a supermajority of conservative Christian nationalists running the state. You know, all of the polls show that they are out of touch with Ohioans. And it just doesn't matter because they don't have to worry about getting elected. Because they've rigged the game. And we need to change it. Thank you for listening to this episode. You can check out more information, including links to sources used, in our show notes on our website at secularleft.us. Secular Left is hosted, written, and produced by Doug Berger, and he is solely responsible for the content. Send us your comments, either using the contact form on the website or by sending us a note at comments at secularleft.us. Our theme music is Dank and Nasty, composed using Amplify Studio. See you next time.